Earth Core 1, Day 1, Scene 1. Volcanoes are creepy, and there are gripes as the car shot over the end of the rise. It became airborne for half a second, and Mum gripped the wheel with white knuckles as the rubber made contact with the road again. She glanced over at Anira and smiled. The crater lake spread out below, filling most of the horizon. Anira's gaze caught on a hulking island in the middle. She shivered. Then the land rose up and shrouded it from sight. She glanced at Quincy, her four-year-old brother, still asleep in the back seat. Sigh. She crossed her arms over the seatbelt, staring holes in the windscreen. Mum braked a little as the incline grew steeper between sheep-strewn hills on one side and tall pines on the other. The well-edged Toyota rattled, shifting gears, its low diesel like a big cat's purr. You did get a bit scared the last time we were here. I simply couldn't get you to calm down and go to bed, so that was a long night. But you were only five. Look at you, 17 now. Surely you can handle a bit of geothermal activity. Fine but I'm not going anywhere near the buried village. Chills ran down her back at the thought. A real village where real people had lived, then died when Tarawera blew its top and covered them in several feet of ash. And so recently. You know it's been no time at all since 1886 in volcano years, right? Heaps of people come to Rotorua all the time. It'll be fine. Mum eyed her sideways, then returned her attention to the road. The two-lane highway rose and fell with the land, twisting gently here and there. Every curve brought a new vista of intensely green hills, a lonely farmhouse, a horse with a wind-blown mane peering over a wire fence, a half-round barn of corrugated steel. Anira's heart swelled, creepy volcanoes notwithstanding. This is my country. Even though she'd spent so many years in England, even though her father hadn't been from here, and this was the first time she'd gotten out of the city since their return, this land had nourished her mother's ancestors. With every passing hour of the drive, Anira's soul had become more and more entwined with the terrain, despite her reluctance to embark on the journey. Wild, confident, all-encompassing, its spirit poured into her through her hungry eyes and each breath of its air. Mum had never gotten off the last train of thought. Besides, what about all the volcanoes around home? How are they any less creepy? Anira bit her lip as they turned onto the lakeside road. She stared out at the traffic and the houses beyond. I know, I know, loads of them around town. But they haven't erupted in thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands. Plus, Anira didn't think they were the explosive kind. What about Rangitoto? Mum laughed. It's a thousand years old or even less. Huh, <sighs> don't remind me. Remembering Rangitoto only made Anira wish again for holidays at home, near the sea popping out for a beach swim every day under the watchful guard of the brooding volcanic island. At least there's a lake in Rotorua, she thought, but lakes are always colder. Mum poked a thumb back over her shoulder. If we turned left instead and drove out into the whops, we'd find where my great-grandmother Ophelia was born, in 1883. Anira calculated, so she was three when Tarawera erupted. She'd never thought about it like that before, could hardly imagine how terrified the tiny girl must have been when the volcano's roar awakened half the island on that fateful night. Anira thought of the stoic sepia faces in the frames on the mantle at home. Ophelia had survived the volcano. So, said Mum, what do we want to do in Rotorua? Uh-oh, no buried village, I told you. Of course, you don't have to come with us if we do that. It was always my favourite, that's all. I want to go on the luge, announced Quincy in his just-woken-up voice and raised his hands as if gripping a handlebar. He bent his head and mimed steering around a twisty track. Anira shot him a smile. We must go to one of the big geothermal sites. There are a few to choose from, said Mum. And I'd like to do a day trip to that movie set. You know, that one with the round doors. It's less than an hour away. Anira hmmed, although she was content enough about that. Really, they should have been going there on the way instead of backtracking another time. But it would have made a long day for young Quincy. Her eyes skimmed over the shops, now beginning to cluster around the road into town. Mum took a left turn towards the lake. A group of kids stopped their play and turned to stare at the intruders, frowning. Where's this place we're staying, then? Anira scanned the normal-looking houses of the neighbourhood, as if a nice resort might suddenly materialise. Suddenly she gaped at a soft plume of steam rising from a drain in the gutter. Was that... gulp? No need to ask, it was from one of the boiling springs that riddled the city just beneath the surface. Chill, don't lose it. People lived here after all, right? 
I booked a lakefront cabin, trilled Mum, apparently oblivious to the deadliness of the terrain she was driving them over. There was a really good deal on a one-week stay. Don't make me stay that long, Anira wanted to say, but refrained. A whole week, then she could go home. Day one, scene two. A few more turns through the largely unremarkable neighbourhood, well, apart from the bits where steam rose out of the Earth's nether regions, brought them to a gate bearing a worn sign that read, Cabin Rentals. Gravel crunched under the tyres as Mum squeezed the car between weeping willows that draped their fronds into the driveway. When it widened again after a few twists and turns, they found themselves surrounded by several log cabins. The largest was big enough to be a real house, and a lean-to attached to it bore the title, Reception, painted in hand script. Mum beamed. I'll just check us in and get our key, then we can start unpacking the things. Her mouth stretched so wide that Anira wanted to tell her to stop with the goofy grinning in case she got stuck that way. But that might not be as clever as it sounded in her head. Anira pulled on the door release, and as it cracked open, a waft of air floated in. Fresher air than inside the car, one might expect, and in one sense it was. Anira froze and screwed up her face. It stunk. Mum laughed and shut her door. Good old Rotorua. Smells like boiled eggs. Don't worry, it's just the sulphur in the air. You'll get used to it. Some people even love it. She shut her eyes and sucked in a long sniff. Ah, uh, nothing like it. Anira watched Mum knock on the door of the lean-to, then disappear inside. She leaned across the front seat and pressed the boot opener until there was a click from behind. Only a week. She sighed, a sudden pang of loss shooting through her. Dad would have found this weird as well. Are we there? Quincy cut through her ponderings. Yes, sweetie, we are. Anira tucked her grief back out of sight, smiled at him fisting his eyes, then climbed out of the car. The air hurt her like a freight train. The smell had been noticeable before, but this was a far more physical reaction. Wow. She grabbed at the door frame for support and glanced around to see if anyone had witnessed her stumble. She'd not even taken one step. Breathe. She forced herself to stand still and gather her wits. Rotorua's air was potent. There was no other way to describe it. As she continued her slow, measured breaths, it was as if the minerals in the air pushed into her bloodstream, into her extremities, into every part of her brain. This is unreal, she whispered, holding out a hand in front of her. The world suddenly appeared in high definition. She blinked. No way. She must have been more tired from the trip than she'd thought. Anira shook her head and set about stretching her limbs one by one, then lifted bags and cases from the boot to the ground. Quincy skipped around, like any little kid would do after being cooked up for three hours in a car seat. Anira shushed him when the squeals became ear-piercing. Presently, Mum returned, an older boy at her side. Tiger here is the owner's son. He's going to show us our cabin. Tiger nodded at Anira and must Quincy's hair. She guessed he was a year or two older than herself. Oh, Anira, why did you put the bags on the ground? They'll be all mucky. Mum lifted one and swiped at its now dusty bottom. Tiger was trying to keep a straight face. Anira could tell. Swiftly, he grabbed two of the suitcases and set off. It's this way. Anira was smiling just a little at Mum's drama when Tiger passed a few feet from her on his way towards the cabin. Well, again. The scent that struck Anira now was ten times stronger than the air. Minerals, yes, but more than that. He carried something of the manuka tree, the fragrant leaves and bark. Don't tell me the locals stink too. But it definitely wasn't stinky. It wasn't even the slightest bit unpleasant. Just sharp and very noticeable. She regarded Mum still fussing with the bags. Tiger had stood at least as close to her as he had to Anira. If she wasn't saying anything, neither would she. For now. Manuka is a nice smell, she told herself. She hefted her backpack and a chili bin and wandered after the aromatic resident. He led them between two cabins, then two more, and made a quick turn around a stand of trees that turned out to be hiding one more building. Tiger waved at it. Here you are. The hut sat nestled in a clearing surrounded by skinny trees. Anira hadn't yet seen any water. Where's the lake from here? Tiger set his load on the tiny wooden veranda and pointed past the cabin. You'll find it if you keep going that way for about 30 seconds, but stay on the path. The stream that runs by it is boiling. Anira shivered, but kept it under control. Great, Mum, you've dumped us right on top of future geyser. 
Next minute, Mum trundled, trundled up with the key and her suitcase. She trotted up the three plank steps and jammed the key in the ranch slider door. A little fiddling, and she was in. Anira, at her heels, sniffed the freshly cleaned room. By the door, a tiny table with four chairs abutted a kitchenette. Two sets of bunk beds occupied the back part. An ensuite beckoned behind a half-closed door. Anira set down her stuff and crouched to transfer food from the chili bin into the room's tiny fridge. When she straightened, her vision whirled with a vastness of detailed clarity, and she grabbed at the aluminium sink bench. She shook her head. A good night's sleep should sort this out, whatever it was. Stepping outside again, Anira's body almost wilted again under the air's assault. She returned to the car for another load, her steps weaving slightly despite her best effort. There was only one more bag of food in the boot, so she seized that and slammed the car shut. Back at the cabin, Quincy sat on the floor, driving his toy car left and right, left and right. Anira set the fruit on the table and regarded Mum, who was sitting on one of the lower bunks, a hand to her head. Getting a migraine? Long distance driving sometimes brought it on. I hope not. Anira, would you mind taking Quincy for a little walk down to the lake? Mum's voice was strained. Just like at home, except for the destination. Come on, Quince. Can I bring my car? Sure, but it's going to have to be a flying car now. Anira did not want him trying to drive it all the way along the path. The two of them wandered out of the cabin, leaving Mum to her peace and quiet. Sure enough, as Tiger had said, the path continued on round a bend, out of sight among the trees. Anira remembered Tiger's other advice. Listen, Quince, don't step off the path, okay? This is a really dangerous place. He nodded earnestly, then set off in a zigzagging run that went precisely from one edge of the path to the other. As he went, he held up his car and made motor noises. Anira bit her lip. She wished he wouldn't go quite so near the edge. What if he slipped? But there was no sign of this boiling stream yet. Oh, wow. Quincy stopped just ahead of her at a turn in the path. Anira picked up her pace to catch him. She reached for his shoulders, and now it was as if the entire landscape attacked her. Not just the air or the locals, but the ground itself. Her head buzzed so much it was hard to make out what she was seeing, but several blinks later her eyes cleared, revealing that the trees had come to an end, and the area immediately ahead was in fact a hot swamp. A low dune marked the end of it, some distance away. Its height blocked the view, but perhaps the beach was beyond it. Then she noticed the trickling. Down to the right of the path was indeed a steaming rivulet of clear water with dubious murk lacing its edges. See that, Quince? That's why we've got to stay on the path. Yeah, he took a step, right smack in the centre. No more zigzagging. Anira stayed close behind him, still holding on. As they proceeded into the alien terrain, more steam rose on the left side from puddles surrounded by solid sulfur deposits in pale, smooth yellow. She stared into the hot stream and gasped. Was that an eel? Blink. The serpentine shadow vanished, and she shook her head. Must be imagining things. No fish could live in those temperatures, right? Their progress was slow, but Anira didn't want to take any chances. At one point, she bent to lay a hand on the path's surface and discovered to her horror that it was indeed warm to the touch. Quince, remind me not to come here, down here without shoes on. He was too busy placing his steps with the utmost care to reply. The dune grew nearer, and when they climbed it, finally, the lake sparkled at their feet. The water was calm, with barely a wave skimming the surface. Anira stepped across the few feet of sand to the lapping edge and stuck her hand in to reassure herself. Cold, of course. The boiling stream entered it not far away, as evidenced by the fumes rising just down the beach to their right. Farther along that way, she spied a quaint church tower and city buildings beyond. To the left, beyond some trees, stretched shoreline suburbs until they faded into the green-lined horizon that defined the larger part of the lake. Quincy jammed his car in his pocket and hand-shoveled the grey sand into a mound for a sandcastle. Anira settled herself down nearby to watch, wondering how long she should give Mum to recover from the drive. She stared out over the water as Quincy continued to dig. If not for its violent volcanic history, this place would be perfectly beautiful. Sunlight glinted on the water, but did not penetrate the island's solid wall of dark trees. All at once, Quincy gasped and shrank back from his construction site. What is it, sweetie? Hot! Anira appeared into the hole, now several inches deep. Water bubbled up from below the sand, steaming slightly. 
She shifted nervously, noting that the sand she sat on was warmer than it had any right to be. I know what, said Quincy. I'll mix in some cold water. He pushed his pile of sand to one side, forgotten. Small hands hollowed out a channel from the lake to the heated hole, and soon the waters mingled. See, he said, just right. Anira squinted at it. The water steamed gently like a warm bath, and she smiled in spite of herself. Come on, let's make the hole bigger. Quincy moved back and commenced additional excavations. Sure, why not? Anira leaned in to help, although her head was about ready to explode from the smell. No, that wasn't right. It didn't hurt, and it didn't stink. Something here was blowing her mind, opening up senses she didn't know she had, and she wasn't sure what to think of it. Anira scooped some warm sand and set it aside. That was tingly. Some grains remained on her hand, and she tilted it in the afternoon sun, so they gave off tiny glints. Together the two dug a larger hole, adjusting the cold water channel to provide the right proportions. Then, quick as a flash, Quincy slipped off his shoes and dipped his feet in the little pool they'd made. He grinned up at her. You should try it. Anira shrugged. She was here. She should experience the place properly. Socks safely tucked inside shoes set partway up the little dune. She slid her toes into the hole. Contact. She'd breathed the air. She'd smelled something on Tiger, but now the sulphur water was on her skin, soaking into her. She hunched over, almost in a fetal position, astounded at how the elements were forcing themselves into her body, her breath catching at the beauty of it. No longer afraid, she raised happy, tear-filled eyes to the shining waters just beginning to reflect the coming of sunset. If she didn't know better, she'd think she was drunk or stoned, except that her perception was heightened instead of numbed, her mind awakened rather than impeded. No wonder people liked coming to Rotorua. Day one, scene three. In the dream I'm crying. I'm crying, but it's not my voice. The images are unclear, the voice is garbled. Ophelia! There's a boom like distant thunder, but it shakes the ground. 11.30pm. Anira flicked off her phone again and rolled over, but sleep would not return. She'd dozed off initially while Mum finished up in the bathroom for the night. Mum now wickered softly in her sleep from the bunk bed opposite. Quincy, of course, had gone out like a light hours ago, after his dinner and nightly routine. She couldn't understand it. She'd been looking forward to sleep all day in the hope that it would help her get past this travel dazedness so she could wake up feeling somewhat normal. Although now that she thought about it, the effect of the air and water could not be blamed on the car journey. Mum must have been expecting it, but Anira was surprised she had not said anything about the trippy mind buzz. Quincy was probably too young to understand it. The fact remained, the other two were asleep, and Anira was not. She sighed and wriggled in her bunk. It was comfortable enough. So why was she wide awake? Tatters of the dream still clung to her memory. Something about Ophelia. She pushed back the duvet, swung herself upright, and shuffled into the bathroom, closing the door before she switched on the light. The mirror on the cabinet revealed nothing unusual. Just the same kid she always saw, the same long dark hair, now slightly frizzy from the tossing and turning, and the same dark brown eyes. She squinted. Surely there'd be bags under her eyes by now after a full day and travelling here. But there wasn't a hint of a shadow. She looked as fresh as the proverbial morning. How peculiar. After using the loo, she stared at her reflection again as she washed her hands. Now that she thought about it, she felt fresh as the morning too, as if she'd just slept a full nine or ten hours, which Mum always said was a good quota for a teenager. Dousing the light plunged her face into blackness again. She opened the door, groped her way back to her bunk, and sat on the edge of it, tapped her phone for the time, 11.37pm. Odd as it was, sleep was the last thing she wanted. Hmm, just like when I was five. Anira slipped into a hoodie and carefully unlatched the ranch slider, drawing it silently open. She didn't reel quite so much at the fresh outdoor air, no doubt because there was plenty of it inside the room already. But there was definitely something more to it out here. Sniff. It really wasn't so much a stink as an atmosphere. She could handle it. She slid the glass door shut to a crack. It would be safe enough to leave it unlocked. Turning, she viewed the clearing. And what a view. The low half-moon lit the sky from the direction of the lake, above the trees. Outside its glow, stars pricked the blackness, many more than she would see from home. The ring of trees jutted up, forming stark shadows. Surprisingly, she could still make out the path before her. She'd brought her phone for a light, 
but left it in her pocket and stepped off the veranda. A light wind swished in the leaves as she set off. There was no other sound but her footsteps in the pale crushed pumice until she reached the end of the woods where the boiling stream joined the path. The steam rose off it, white in the moonlight, and she stared fascinated, then knelt to hold her hands over the heat source. The fumes wove up through her fingers, creating braided ephemeral plumes. Vapour clung to her skin and dampened the cuffs of her hoodie. She smiled and straightened carefully, realising she'd forgotten her shoes. But somehow she didn't care anymore. There was that buzz again. Boy, they should send all the stoners here. It was better than weed. Not that she really knew what that was like, but she'd passed some kids sharing a joint behind a shed at school and caught a whiff of their smoke. She thought she might have some idea of its effect. It was nothing compared to this. Her thoughts opened up, and she smelled the mineral air even more intensely than before. Her hearing grew sensitive to the bubbling of many tiny jets of hot water pushing up from below the thin crust of earth. She straightened and strode towards the dirt dune, hardly looking at her bare feet. Feet now warmed by the ground itself. What a difference to earlier today. The environment had gotten into her, quelled her fear, strange as that was, although it was still there, buried deep for the moment. She topped the sandy rise and drew in a sharp breath. Moonlight had turned the lake to pure silver, drawing a path of bright white from her feet to the distant bank. Off to one side, the island's shadow interrupted the reflections from the sky. Steam rose from a few places along the nearby shore. One of them was Quincy's hollow in the sand, just as they had left it. Anira sat on the beach and widened the little channel from the lake. Cold water flowed in, and the steam abated a little. She tested the temperature, widened it some more, then plunged both feet in almost to the knee. She gasped. This would never get old. It was as if the water grabbed her, massaging her flesh without any actual pressure. As the minutes passed, she was sure the massage sensation was expanding through her whole body, though she didn't know how that could be happening. Anira raised her eyes to the water again and gaped. She could swear her vision was sharper than before. Or maybe growing accustomed to the dark, she now identified several places around the lake and on the island that must be hot springs, for they sent up their own plumes of steam into the night. Insects swarmed around her, but none came close. Weird. Usually the mozzies would be eating her alive. As she watched, her eyes caught a movement. Continuing to focus, she saw a tiny light for a moment, then a shape elongating upwards which could be a person. The figure stood at the edge of the island, then separated from it, running. There must be people living out there. The shadow was now some distance from the island proper, running towards the city. There must be a sandbar or something. Anira blinked as the person appeared to veer towards her, circling back around the near side of the island. Lots of sandbars then, or just a low water level? The runner ran on. Just before the shadow veered away from her position, Anira smelled a whiff of something similar to the woodsy ambience that came from Tiger. A local then. Again, it was not an unpleasant scent, as her first impression had told her. Rather, like the air, it was simply a part of being here. Even though these individuals strongly radiated a combination of manuka wood, and the minerals that were so prevalent here. The mysterious local continued to run, describing a large circle almost all the way around the island. Anira was sorry when the shadow finally vanished behind the black mound, and made a mental note to try walking those sandbars herself in daylight. It looked like fun, and unlike the tidal flats in Auckland, there would be no danger of imminently rising water levels. She was still wide awake, so she pulled out her phone and activated its browser. With the search bar ready, she pressed to activate the microphone, then spoke. Rotorua Geothermal High. The results varied from high mountains, Tarawera, to high schools. Perhaps she needed to phrase her query better. She pondered. Effects of Rotorua Minerals. And was rewarded with a list of anti-aging benefits. Hmm. How about mental effects of Rotorua Minerals? This time, the results focused on relaxation. She didn't think that was it either. She'd barely had a chance to relax, and she'd only slept a tiny bit this evening. After a few more fruitless searches, she tried heightened senses in Rotorua, which brought a direct hit on a blog article of the same name. Here we go. She clicked through, and was disappointed to find it was just a primary school class blog, and the post had been written years ago by a local nine-year-old. Still, she read on. The child named Blazar McRae told a story relayed by his grandmother who claimed to have known an old man 80 years ago who had been able to tell her the ripeness of the fruit on trees in Hamarana at the far north of the lake. The grandmother, a child herself at the time, had asked him how he knew when he had not been up that way recently. 
The old man had simply turned his head, looked out across the lake, and said, I see it. The rest of the article contained other anecdotes from the grandmother's childhood, but nothing else that was relevant. The colour of the fruit on trees across the lake, eh? Anira squinted over the water, but try as she might, she could not make out any details. She'd seen a figure against the moonlit surface, but that wasn't too far out of the ordinary, right? She shifted her toes in the gritty bottom of the hole and fresh water blowed up. Flowed up, burning hot. She yelped and yanked her feet out, but not before the heat rushed up through her body and zapped her head into searing awareness, like a jolt of supercharged caffeine. No wonder she couldn't sleep. Weird that Mum and Quincy weren't affected, though, but Mum hadn't stuck her feet in it, and maybe the stuff worked differently on kids. She sure would have appreciated a tip from Mum, something like, hey, don't touch the water if you want to sleep tonight. Maybe Mum had forgotten. Anira rolled to her feet and stepped into the cool lake water, plunging in until it covered her knees. Her legs cooled off. Apparently the water hadn't been hot enough to burn. Either that, or she'd fast acted fast enough to prevent injury. But her brain still fizzed and buzzed. Its gears churning. The way she felt now, she could end all the world's problems just by thinking about it long enough. But that can't be true, can it? When she'd cooled off enough, she sat back down, adjusted the mix of water in the pool, and soaked her feet again. What if I could cure cancer? Kids shouldn't have to lose their dads. She opened a blank page on her phone and began to type.